In order to make a dent in the world that we're going after, you have to measure millions and billions of molecules in a single run of an instrument. And that can't take more than a few days. And the reason you have to measure that much is that your cells, each cell has a lot of proteins in it. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. Today we have the honor of speaking with Sujal Patel, co-founder of Nautilus Biotechnology. Welcome, Sujal. Thank you, Jonathan Forrest. Thanks for having me. To get our audience up to speed with what you're working on, could you tell us uh, a, a bit more about Nautilus Biotechnology? Sure. Um, Nautilus Biotechnology is a incredibly interesting problem between the biological domain, physical sciences domain, and the tech domain. You know, if I'm to explain the company in story form, what I'd say is, is that if you look at biotechnology over the course of the last two decades, and specifically we look at genomics, we as humanity have conquered genomics over the course of the last two decades. Today, if I take a drop of your blood and I want to understand what your genome is, I can get you 99% of your genome for $1,000 in a couple of days. It's a complete commodity. But the issue is, is that your genome really doesn't change from the day that you're born to the day that you die. It actually is very static. It doesn't contain any of the real-time information about whether you're sick today or what's going on. And because of that, there is this big move to try to understand more of what's going on in your cells. And your cells are all made of proteins. And if you really want to understand what's going on inside of human body, you have to get to the protein level. And the issue that exists in the world today is that the very best techniques that we have to analyze proteins from that same drop of blood or from any biological sample are very different than genomics. In the genome, take a drop of blood, $1,000 in a few days, I get 99% of the answer. If I want the proteome, which is the makeup of all your proteins, I could take that same drop of blood, the very best techniques on the earth, leveraging complex pieces of equipment like mass spectrometers, would take $50,000 in a month to analyze that sample. And at the conclusion of that, we would have identified 8%, single digit, 8% of the proteins that are in sample. And so yes. Nautilus was founded to try to, to improve that dramatically. So can you walk us through like exactly why we would want to know, you know, what's in the particular proteins? Because I imagine your DNA, right, encodes for all of those proteins to allow them to exist. Um, do you, are you trying to get information on environmental factors or, or different things um, from those tests? It's much more than just environmental factors, but I think that, that Forrest, you're on the right track there. So obviously your genome encodes all of the possible proteins that could be created, but for a wide variety of reasons, what's occurring in your cells and the proteins in your cells do not match in any particular way what your genomic you know, if we look at it in software terms, what your software code says. And that's, and that's the reason why if you took, you know, two twins and you let them uh, age to their 40 and one took care of themselves and one ate potato chips all day and never exercised, they'd look completely different. The environmental factors, the health factors, what's going on in a particular body, all those things are encoded in your proteins. This is the reason why if you looked at the FDA approved drugs, over 90% of the FDA approved drugs target proteins. Most of our diagnostics target proteins. And you know, one of the side effects of this inability to measure proteins effectively is that drug development has gotten less efficient and it's gotten, it's gotten worse. So over the last two decades, if you looked at the number of new FDA approved drugs every year, it's basically dead flat. And that's in the face of a quadrupling of the global R&D spend in pharma from about 50 billion to 200 billion. So we've quadrupled spend, but FDA approvals is flat. And because of that, only two out of 12 marketed drugs that reach the market actually return the R&D dollars that went into them. And the efficacy and the timelines have, ex have become worse and extended. And you know, not understanding 
the proteins which make up all of your cells is a huge part of that problem that's, that's been created here. This is a, as you're saying, it's, it's, you're conveying that it's a really complicated problem set. Um, and so I'm curious, with your background uh, with, as, as CEO of uh, Isilon Systems, which um, my understanding was uh, far, far and away from a biotech company. And so could you just tell us a bit how to connect those dots between your work with Isilon um, and then now finding yourself at, at the helm of a really exciting biotech company? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, Jonathan, because uh, the path for me to get from my last company to here is, is a really interesting path. And it's, uh, and it's one of those sort of small world types of stories. So my last company, uh, well, let me kind of back up. I mean, up until four years ago, my entire career has been in the tech world. And the last company that I was founder and CEO of was a company called Isilon. It was a company founded in January of 2001, went public in 2006. And then we eventually sold it um, for 2.6 billion in 2010. That company was focused on building a new storage architecture for unstructured information, things like digital content, video and images, machine generated data. Two decades ago, the storage systems of the time were really focused on storing text-based information and databases and your credit card transactions. And so we built a scalable architecture and we took that to the world focused on different verticals that were undergoing a digital transformation. So we started selling at an, into companies doing photo sharing on the internet, into film broadcast and television, which was undergoing a transition from analog to digital. And then we moved into manufacturing and semiconductor. And by 04 and 05, um, life sciences and biomedical research became a really big market for us. And this revolution that occurred in genetic sequencing was a big part of the success that we had in that vertical market. Back in 2004, which is, you know, 16 years ago, I met a guy named Parag Malik, and Parag became a very large customer of mine at Isilon, supporting his proteomics research lab at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And Parag, 16 years later, is my co-founder here at Nautilus. And that, you know, our paths intersected many times over the course of, you know, those 16 years. First, Parag, was in our it was in a you know in the role of a customer to me and I got to know Parag really well and thought he was one of the smartest guys that I ever met. Uh, about nine years ago Parag left um, his role at Cedar Sinai and went to Stanford to teach and start a research lab which was really building uh, technologies to personalize medicine with a focus of sitting at the intersection of tech and biotech. Parag's kind of a unique animal and that he has academic degrees in both biochemistry and computer science. And my wife and I were so impressed with the work that he was trying to do at his lab and that he has done that we decided to philanthropically support his lab. And we've done that for the last nine years, which built a really close relationship between Parag and I. And that led to Parag calling me up in 2016 and saying, hey, I'm going to have to start a company because I have an idea and let me tell you about it. And what started as a conversation soliciting advice very quickly turned into a, you know, a two founders going off and trying to solve a really tough, really hard problem. And you know, it's been an amazing ride for four years, kind of moving from the crackpot idea phase through feasible and and now into real engineering. That's uh, so cool to hear how it's uh, almost like an organic relationship that developed um, that you you found that you could uh, you know worked well together because of uh, co-founding a company is is non-trivial and absolutely a strain on a relationship what were you doing uh, when you got that call in 2016 and um, what were you looking for your your next big company to start yeah so it's sort of it's interesting right so we sold Isilon in December of 2010 and we were we just closed about a our $100 million quarter. And I had committed to the acquiring company that I would grow the business to a billion dollar run rate, and then I would leave. Um, we were at a very high growth rate that only took 23 months. And then I left. And uh, you know, I did some consulting for them to help them through a few other things that were going on. But largely, I started to think about what I wanted to do next. And I hung out with venture capitalists. I made a lot of investments in companies. In total, I've made about 80 investments in the last 10 years in private companies. 
Uh, I had six boards at some point and I started to work with entrepreneurs. And about six months in, I realized that um, that I, I, I couldn't be on boards and invest. I really was too young, too passionate, too excited to go and actually build something. And I knew I wanted to go out and do something again. But I also knew that I didn't want to do enterprise software, enterprise hardware. I didn't want to do something that was like what I did before. And I also had this burning desire to go work on really hard problems that have big societal impact. And so I was only really looking in three areas. I was looking in, in, in healthcare technology, uh, I was looking in clean energy, and I was looking at a couple of ideas in consumer, which would have very broad implications. And that's it. And none of those ideas ever graduated to the point where I said that was the one for me until Prague came. And it literally was that first one hour call with Prague. I went through it. I'm like, okay, if anyone were to bring me an idea like this, I'd call Prague and say, Prague, what do you think about this idea? <laughs> and then I said to myself, Prague's not the guy who's going to go put his Stanford uh, career, which is really successful on hold if this wasn't incredibly exciting in the opportunity of a lifetime. And I got there in, in one hour. Obviously, there are a lot more conversations from there. But in one hour, I was like, okay, this is this is it. Like, this is the thing. And uh, and it's been it's been super exciting getting into a whole new and different space. So you called it's the a, early phase of the, the company or, you know, the crackpot idea phase. Now, is it was it really just was it really a crackpot idea? Did you did you shift a lot into what it is now? Or were you just getting more information to gain confidence that you had something really special? So that's an interesting question, right? I mean, we, tongue in cheek, we call this the crackpot idea phase in 2016. But what I will tell you is, is that the idea was really unformed at that point. But we had an idea that the method that Parag was proposing to analyze huge numbers of proteins and get to a very specific identification of what those proteins are. We had an idea that that, 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 that that was possible, but there were a huge number of unanswered questions. And a big chunk of it was related to the core algorithm that Parag was conceived and that he conceived of that is the underpinnings of what we do. And a big part of it is how do we scale this up and do it reliably at massive scale at low cost? And that, that part is really the bulk of what we took the last four years working, what we've done over the last four years. The first six months were algorithmically moving it from crackpot idea to, okay, this really can happen. And uh, in all honesty, uh, I said to myself, well, let's go see what happens. Six months, I have six months to spare. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'll go find the next thing. Um, but, you know, uh, two things happened during those six months. Uh, number one, I realized that Parag um, were, and I worked really closely together and that there was a massive opportunity as we started to talk to customers for what we were trying to do. And the second thing is, is that in that six months when we fully fleshed out the algorithmic part and the computational parts of what Parag was proposing, we realized that the, the job was going to be a lot easier than we had originally indicated, originally had a thought as well. And so once that was fully fleshed out, we realized, boy, this is actually not just feasible, but like I see a path to go and get this done. And that was when we really started to raise money and, and really start to hire and, and go after it. With the in this particular uh, sort of problem area that that Prog identified as something that where he could really move the needle, um, some my understanding of, of this area is that one of the big limiters is the data set. Like just where do we get the data to be able to then do, do all what I'll call sort of complexity analysis to be able to identify certain proteins or derivatives that could be great for a drug target. Uh, how, how are you uh, addressing that, that lack of data? Yeah, what's, if you take a step back for a second, um, I think there are three you know, the underpinning of your question is, well, how do you deal with the tough stuff? And you said data. Data is one of the tough things that we have to deal with. There's a massive chunk of data at the end of the pipeline. There is a huge amount of information that needs to be gathered by instrumentation, which has never been built to gather this much information. 
And then on the biochemistry side, there is a huge amount of complexity in trying to analyze the molecules that we're going after. And it, it might be interesting just to kind of, I'll, I'll double click quickly on each of those areas and then you guys can delve in and tell me which areas you think are most interesting. But in, in the biochemistry side, one of the things that made genomic sequencing possible was that nature already has a mechanism to go and copy and read DNA. It has to copy it for cell division so that each cell has a copy of the DNA and it has to read it so that a, a, uh, a process can be undergone to trans transform DNA into RNA, which then becomes protein. And in order to make a genomic sequencer, you know, Lumina, which is the you know, world leader by far in genomic sequencing, built a system that took a, a DNA fragment, amplified it, meaning copied it many, many times, and that enabled them to get signal amplification, which made the process of measuring it easier. Um, for us, once something becomes a protein in nature, there are no mechanisms to read it back or to copy it. And so without those mechanisms, without a way to optically look at it, because these objects are minuscule, they're well below the optical resolution of any microscope because they're orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of light. Um, without a way of measuring these molecules, it's really, really difficult. Without a way to borrow from nature in order to, to measure these molecules, it's really difficult to develop a method. And that's what that's one of the ahas that Parag had. And you know, the crux of his method is that instead of trying to make a specific identification of what a molecule is, if we borrow from computer science a technique that probes the molecule many, many, many times, each probe leaking slightly different information about the molecule, that you could computationally combine that to get to a very specific identity of what that molecule is. And then you have to figure out how do you do that in parallel for a large number of molecules. That's the second part of the problem. In order to make a dent in the world that we're going after, you have to measure millions and billions of molecules in a single run of an instrument. And that can't take more than a few days. And the reason you have to measure that much is that your cells, each cell has a lot of proteins in it. There's roughly a million protein molecules in every cell. You know, in a typical pharmaceutical drug development application, you might be dealing with 96 well plates. Each one of them have a thousand cells in it. So if you can't churn through billions of molecules, you're not going to be able to make a dent even if you could do better in terms of protein identification. And we've had to spend enormous amount of effort figuring out how can we, in our biochip, have density so that when you're scanning it, that we're able to get a lot of information quickly. We've had to make a lot of innovations in microscopy to figure out how we can image these molecules at a single molecule level at speed. We had to make a lot of uh, a lot of innovations in the microfluidic system and all the things that we need to uh, probe these molecules over and over again. So there's a huge body of work there. And then once that's done, it goes into a computer. The computer is dealing with 10 or 20 terabytes of raw information coming off the instrument every day. That has to get reduced in real time. These are images, so they have to first get de-skewed. They have to deal with pincushion distortion. They have to deal with all the fuzziness of imaging at very low light levels, which is what we have to deal with. And from there, then we reduce the data set, we send it to the cloud. And computation using this algorithm that Parag conceived of four years ago requires hundreds of cores and many hours of compute power. And so that's just to get to quantification of what's in my sample, what's in that drop of blood. And then from there, the question is, well, how do I use that information to build better drugs, to build diagnostics, to personalize medicine? And that's a whole area of, of exploration that we will be a big part of, but our customers will also be really an integral piece of. Now, when you say each cell has you know, millions of different proteins, are you actually characterizing you know, a million proteins in a single cell? Are you cataloging everything? At our, we believe, as a company that in order to be useful to pharma, you need to be able to analyze the vast majority of the proteins that are in a very large, you know, a large number of cells. So not just one cell, but hundreds or thousands of cells. And so we're building technology to be able to do that effectively. One of the things that's really interesting about this company is that 
uh, let me kind of draw an analogy back to the genomics world. In the genomics world, before Illumina came along, there was a method of sequencing, or a couple, but Sanger sequencing being one of them, which was slow and expensive, but it was 100% right, or pretty much 100% right. And what Illumina figured out how to do is to make this a commodity. How can I make it fast, cheap, and that's 99% accurate. For us, you know, there are some new companies in the, in the proteomics world that are trying to do things like sequencing and trying to get to 100% but those aren't techniques that are going to lead to a massively parallel approach that will democratize access to the proteome for drug development companies, for pharma. We're building an approach from day one that's focused on, we're not going to get a 100% answer, but we'd like to get some very high percentage of the answer, but we'd like to do it very quickly at low cost. And so for us, you know, being able to analyze, you know, not just the million proteins on average that are in one cell, but to be able to do that for hundreds of thousands is, is the goal of this company. This topic is, I mean, it's in the nicest of ways. It's the playground of PhDs who have studied this for their whole academic and professional lives, it seems. So what was it like for you who had a very, a, a different and equally specialized, but a different skill set, then starting to learn um, sort of like the, what what Parag has been working on for so long. Yeah, it, it's been very interesting, right? So one of the things that makes the combination of Parag and I unique is that in order to bring this innovation to the world, we're going to have to build an entirely new instrument. And that instrument has chemistry, it has biology, it has imaging, biophysics, hardware, software. On our staff are mechanical engineers, software engineers, electrical engineers, biophysicists working side by side, biochemists, organic chemists, um, bioengineering majors. All of these disciplines come together to build a complete solution. And you know, Parag's experience virtually spans the entire range, but I've spent the bulk of my career on the second part of that, which is from the hardware engineering to the software and the data science side of things. And so the combination is quite powerful. And in addition to that, the distribution model for products in this world is very, very similar to the distribution model that we had at Isilon, my last company. It's literally, you just change the titles of the different people in the go-to-market organization and they match up almost identically in terms of how they function. Um, but for me, I had a lot to catch up on to get going in this company and it was really an it was a fascinating experience for me in the first six months to figure out how I was going to get up to speed in this world. So the first thing I did uh, was that I went on YouTube and I went and found every biology and chemistry class that I could and I set my speed to 1.5x and I started churning through those as fast as I could. And every day I created, a, it was a list, I called it dumb questions of the day. And I would make a list, and at the end of the day, I'd call Parag, and sometimes it would take 20 minutes, sometimes it would take two hours, but we would go through all of my dumb questions. And Parag is a saint, he's, a, he's an academic professor, he's very patient, and he went through all of my questions. And I went through successive levels of classes that were more and more sophisticated to get to the point where I had a basic understanding of the, of, of the subject matter that I was going into. And then I started research, reading research papers once I got enough of that knowledge. And I read probably 500 plus research papers, maybe a thousand research papers in that first year. And I still go through roughly one a day or something like that on average. And then you start to really consume that information. And so today, you know, I'm nowhere near an expert in anything, but in the one area where we are focused, uh, I've been getting deeper and deeper and deeper. That's amazing. So complete immersion is your strategy. Yes, that's right. And that's that's got to be what you got to do. So, um, yeah. so I'm curious about the you know you call it an instrument and it has all these components and it, it seems very complex. Like, is is this actually like a physical device or is it more like a lab? You know, like what does the product look like? Yeah. So ultimately, what we are building is we are building an instrument much like a genomic sequencer. I mean, genomic sequencers, you can buy them from a number of companies. They show up as a box. The box sometimes would be, you know, the size of a, of a 
small bench. So maybe it's a three foot wide by two foot by three foot high instrument, depending on how big it is and how fast it is. There are some companies out there that are building sequencers that are more like the size of a toaster today, um, but it's a physical piece of equipment. And so for us, that's about, you know, the, the, the first generation of sequencers, the next generation of sequencing wave were about the size of kind of a few feet by a few feet by a few feet. And that's what our initial product will be. It'll be an instrument that's about that size. And our job will be to take that technology and make it reliable and reproducible enough that we can ship it to any lab in the world and anyone can easily run a proteomic analysis. Now, between where we are today and that world, there will certainly be a phase where we've cracked the code and we can do it. We're just not ready to give you a box yet. And that'll be a really interesting phase of partnership between us and a number of pharma organizations and, and diagnostic companies. And we're starting to talk to many of those partners today as we are looking at uh, starting some of those early experiments next year. And then I assume you'll also have the, you know, the processing component probably still in the cloud. So the instrument will just like plug into the wall and, and upload the data. Yes, that is right. So the amount, so there's kind of, you know, if you think about the data pipeline, the instrument is going to offload images to a, a local computer. That computer is going to have to receive a massive amount of information and reduce it to something that's suitable for sending over a wide area network. And then it's going to have to go to the cloud. The amount of compute power that we need is probably infeasible for most organizations to have on site. And so we'll send it up to the cloud for analysis, and then we'll have a platform there where customers can access their data, can look at their results, and then eventually we'll provide more and more analysis capabilities in the cloud so that our customers are receiving insight, not just raw data. How, with, um, let me just say that again, how do you, uh, would you compare Nautilus Biotechnology, uh, at least draw a distinction between that and, say, uh, SEER, uh, SEER Bio? where my understanding is that they, they're somewhere in this space as well. It would be useful, I think, to discuss sort of the broader landscape of the companies that are out there. There are really uh, two major existing categories of proteomic analysis. One is there's a larger amount of companies that produce assays, which are specific panels that will identify the relative quantities of some known proteins in a sample. So if I take a, a if I take some cells and I and I run an assay that can identify 10 or 20 different proteins, what the assay will tell me is the relative abundance of protein A is three times as much as protein B, and I didn't see any protein C. It's a relative abundance because these assays are very fuzzy and it only has, it only can support a very small number of protein molecules because you have to have antibodies for all the proteins that you would want to analyze in an assay. And we as humanity haven't built more than a few thousand assays, a few thousand antibodies that will identify different proteins. And, you know, the human proteome has 10 times more, it has 25,000 basic forms of proteins to go after. And then there's isoforms and modifications and other things. So that's one category. So it's a very targeted analysis and it's fuzzy because it's, it's done in relative abundance. The next category is, is what's largely used for what's called discovery proteomics, which is I have a sample and I just want to know the most about what's in the sample. And customers who want to do the very best analysis use mass spectrometers today. And I think you guys are familiar because I know that you did a, uh, a recent video on mass spectrometry. But what a mass spectrometer is, is it's a large, complicated instrument. It's actually built for the atomic program. And it, its job is to weigh fragments of molecules. And so what we do to use the mass spectrometer for protein analysis is we take protein molecules we fragment those molecules into pieces. We send them through the mass spectrometer. And through a complex process, it's essentially telling you what the atomic mass is of each of those fragments. And then on the other side, we use a set of very complicated um, bioinformatics to reassemble that information into what the identities might have been for the various proteins that I put in. This is a pretty fuzzy process. It suffers from you know, two dramatic limitations. One is that 
it has a very um, has a very limited dynamic range. And so if you hand it blood, for example, without any treatment, most of your blood is made up of albumin, which is basically just a protein that's just there and, and, and is the bulk of your blood. If you sent that to a mass spectrometer, it would return everything's albumin because it's always going to return the most abundant stuff in a sample. And so, you know, that's problem number one. Problem number two is it's just not, it's not a very, it's not a very specific instrument either. And we're talking about sensitivity and specificity here. And so the, the thing that customers have been doing is working on techniques in front to separate different types of proteins from one another so that the mass spectrometer has a better shot of returning useful information. And typically what, uh, what people use is they use a, a UPLC, which is essentially a purification method. So in one incarnation of the system, it may strip out from blood the top 14 proteins that show up so that the mass spectrometer has a shot of identifying some interesting stuff beyond it. Those techniques are one complicated and expensive, two, they introduce bias into the results, and three, they're just not super effective. And so um, the the 8% number that I gave you is roughly, you know, identifying 1,500 to 2,000 proteins. That's using a very complicated method of, of, of using columns that go and remove the abundant stuff from the blood and, and make a better analysis. This is really uh, where SEER comes into play. SEER is a company that is focused on a better method of preparing the sample up front than what a UPLC can do. And so those are that's a great method for improving the efficacy of what comes out of a mass spectrometer, but it doesn't fundamentally overcome the limitations of a mass spectrometer. And that's where this third group of companies comes into play. And I think that, you know, in the third group, I would put those companies like us, of which we don't know anyone else like us, and then those companies that are focused on trying to sequence proteins. Sequencing proteins is a hard and complex challenge. It requires very sophisticated biochemistry. We, the methods are not quite uh, evolved enough where you know it's really feasible today. Um, and the other thing is, is that you still have to fragment these proteins into peptides to be able to sequence them because there's limitations in terms of the length that you can uh, that you can that you can sequence. And so with that, you lose sensitivity, you have a dramatic loss of sensitivity in the analysis. And so we, when we look at the the different competitors out there in the marketplace and different approaches. That's kind of the segmentation that we so my So my understanding then is that the, the real uh, value is coming after hunting down these less abundant uh, proteins, right? And so, and, and the, that connecting this back then to um, the, the, what the general public kind of would, what they need to know about, the really importance of this kind of new type of technology that you and your team are building. It's that if Nautilus Bio is able to um, help, say, a Pharmaco and other parts of its, its customer set to be able to identify less abundant proteins, then that in turn um, is valuable because then the Pharmacos could develop um, better, more targeted, personalized medicine. Is that, that that's, that's, thought, correct? that's you're exactly right. So today, for a pharma organization, let's you know, in a simple model here, if a pharma company has a set of samples that have a disease cell or disease cells, and they have a set of samples that have healthy cells, what they want to do is figure out what are the differences between these cells. And once I figure out what the difference is, and by the way, most of the time over 90% of the time, the difference is there's a protein difference between these. The goal then is, well, how do I build a compound that's going to be able to target that protein difference, and then I can deliver some kind of therapeutic? So if that's what I'm trying to do, I need to ignore the abundant stuff because that's the same, that's the stuff that is common between disease cells and healthy cells. I need to focus on what are the rare things that are in these cells that are very different. Um, we're, we've been talking to uh, one of the top 10 pharmas for a long time and the, the key scientist there, one of the things that he's told us is that in their mass, mass spectrometry core, the most interesting targets they find are at the very, very bottom of the detection threshold of mass spec. So his comment to us was, if you could just push that down 5%, 
all that next stuff is going to be super interesting because it's the rare stuff that we're looking for. And so the ability to get deeper has dramatic impacts on discovering what targets these pharma companies might want to use for their next therapeutic. And it also has broad implications to understanding how those therapeutics will work, right? Another example in pharma is that when you've developed a compound, now you have to try to figure out, well, what's the therapeutic window? How much of this compound, how much of this drug could I give somebody in order to get the positive effect that I want, but not have negative effects through the body? And today, measuring negative effects through the body is, it's really just a crapshoot, right? I try it in an animal, I try it in a human, and we see what happens. Because we don't understand if I were to show this compound to all the other cells in your body, we have no way of profiling in advance what changes are occurring, where's the cross-reactivity. The promise of being able to dig further into your cellular machinery and your proteins is that we'll be able to back up in the drug development process and understand, well, how else would, how would this drug impact my cardiac system, my cells in my liver, my kidney. And if we could do that, it would make the drug development process much more efficient and much more effective. What, walk me through then what, uh, like the, the interface between uh, your company and your customers. Is it that a customer comes saying, like, hi, Nautilus, we'd like um, help understanding an activation pathway for like a particular disease? And then they give you that that sort of you know requirements document, and then Nautilus returns and says, "Okay, on, along the pathway are all these different types of proteins. So take a look at those." Um, you ask a complex question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think that there there are a broad range of business models that we will employ as a company. On one end, we will eventually have an instrument. And we will sell to customers the instrument, we'll sell consumables that power it, and we'll sell them software as a platform in the cloud that they can use to analyze their results. And in that model, they're largely in charge of their innovation, and they're using our tools and our platforms to be able to get to that innovation. There are going to be some customers that are going to want a closer engagement with us who are going to want help in trying to identify for a particular pathway what's going on. They are going to want to do things that are more customized on our platform than what our basic platform can do. And in those types of engagements, we are going to partner deeper with them, lending data science capabilities and, and our knowledge base to help them in their mission. And some of those deals may look more like a traditional partnership that a you know, biotech will often have with a pharma company where there'll be milestone payments and, and maybe some upside on the potential joint development. And then the other thing that we're thinking about is that in the first few years of this new technology being available, we're not going to be ready to ship a box to a customer and say, okay, it's all ready to go. It's packaged up neatly with a bow. Just take it out of the box and run. And in that early phase, all of our engagements are going to be very close joint development and engagements, very close collaborations. And so we are, we are up for helping our customers in whatever way yields joint discoveries faster, because that's in the benefit of both our customer and us, right? Our customer wants to get to innovation so they can build their next new drug. And we want to go and prove out this new platform and show that it's valuable to the world because it's going to be great for our business. And just because it's like a hot topic right now is, are you doing any partnerships uh, exploring, you know, potential treatments or um studying COVID-19? It's an interesting question. We are, we are not far enough along today to make a dent in the COVID world. Uh, we've had many conversations with customers where they're like, boy, I would love to have this question answered. We're not there yet today, right? We're not out asked, we're not analyzing customer samples. We, we can't give you, you know, a huge proteomic analysis. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see how fast this pandemic will go away, but I, I, if I were to bet on it, I think that our technology will get to the point where it's valuable in this pandemic at some point, because mm -hmm. I don't, this isn't going to go away overnight. Oh, no, it's protecting against future pandemics as well. So. For sure. That's a big part of what we want to make sure we do here. 
I suppose when when you're wearing your CEO hat, it's uh, even though you may not have the the offering on the table now to be able to help um, sort of fight this particular fight. But it must be awesome validation to have uh, customers or prospective customers come knocking, looking for that. That it looks like that as you build out these offerings, that it'll be really um, potentially game changing for for uh, for these folks. Um, and yeah, rapid, for sure. Uh, rapid yeah, development of, of new new medications and and so much more b- between that. Yeah, even more broadly than that, uh, we're excited with our customers reaction, not just in COVID, but just across a very broad range of applications. So I share with you a funny anecdote. Um, We recently had a press release that we hired. um, We hired this guy, Nick Nelson, to be our chief business officer. Well, Nick is a well-known and super well-regarded business executive in in the biotech space. And he spent a decade of his career at Illumina. And, you know, now that Nick has been involved in some of our pharma conversations and had joint calls with Parag, my co-founder, uh, you know, one of the comments that he made to Parag, uh, and uh, I, I, I've talked to Parag about this in the past, was that, hey, Parag, you realize, you know, that these conversations aren't supposed to be 100% positive with customers. You're supposed to, like, have a one in five hit rate. One <laughs> time they say, hey, can you do this? Let's go do it. At four out of five, they're like, hey, this is great. Come back to me when it works. And that's just not the case here. Every customer conversation is like, what can I do tomorrow? How can I get to the next step? How can you help me in this or this or this? And it's really gratifying, right? Because what it tells us is that we're really, uh, we're really, uh, we're really scratching an itch that they have that's really important to their businesses. And we're working as fast as we can, but we know that this technology will be really impactful when it gets out there. So what sort of things are you doing given the massive demand and, you know, what what are the things that you're doing to work as fast as you can? Like what steps are you taking to kind of accelerate your development process? Um, well, so that's, a, that's an interesting question, right? Um, we are building a company for the long run, right? And so there is definitely a balance there of speed and making sure that we're building a foundation that enables us to attract A players and build a great corporate culture and build an organization that's gonna be here in 20 years and be a a huge player in this future proteomics industry. And so, you know, there's a lot of tension to to building a company when you have that kind of viewpoint, right? I mean, first and foremost, if you want to go and you wanna move quickly, you should have a lot of capital. And, you know, we've been very fortunate that you know, just in the last three and a half years, we've raised $109 million of capital. We have a blue chip set of investors across the biotech and the tech worlds, um, including some you know, public private crossover money. And so we've got a great group of investors that's given us the capital to grow quickly and to go after this problem aggressively. Um, but still, you know, today we're still only a 55 person company. I, I've told Parag and my recruiting team, I'd like to be at a hundred like tomorrow if I could, but it's just not feasible, right? We're trying to build an organization mm-hmm. for the long term, And we, we had that healthy tension all the time of, well, I know I need some bodies, but they're not the right people. And, um, you know, we think we're making the right decisions for the long term, but, uh, that tension is something I feel and I deal with every day. With the uh, with COVID nineteen, kind of turn that question around. Then on to as as a startup founder and managing not just like you and your your co founder schedules, but now you know, you've got fifty five people and want to double that. How have you been navigating these the challenges of of whether it's shelter in place or and and you were already sort of managing. I understand what two locations in San Carlos, California, Seattle, Washington. What's been working or what and what may have failed in that you, you sort of figured out like, ah, that didn't work um, to, to make it better for running a company in this environment? Yeah, I, I think that um, this has been an area where we have spent a lot of time and energy and we've been pretty intentional. And you have to kind of look at our two offices separately because all of our wet science is done down in the Bay Area. And in Seattle, it's largely software engineering and 
administrative functions. I'm up here. My head of finance is up here. And those are things that can be done from home pretty effectively. So kind of if you look at the Bay Area, once we got to the shelter in place order in California, we did what all companies had to do, which is we shut down and we assessed what do we need to do as an organization to build a safe environment where lab workers can work once it's okay, according to our county and our state regulations. And for us, that meant that we had to spend a lot of time, energy, and money on improving our office so that it could be safe in this COVID world. We added UV sterilizers in our HVAC systems, which was a huge amount of work um, and expensive. We added plexiglass and glass partitions between every office all in our open cubicle area, in our labs. We spaced things out, which made our space utilization much less effective. And we created policies to ensure mask wearing. We created policies to ensure hygiene. We created a schedule for electrostatic de de uh, sterilization of our facilities. You know, one thing after the other. And that, that meant that we were able to get back to somewhat effective work in three weeks and then get back to pretty effective work within the first two months, right? Even today, we still deal with issues, childcare, people are on weird schedules because of their own childcare issues. Uh, we are uh, very conservative with respect to uh, employees if they're exposed or even if they're, you know, two degrees of separation exposed to COVID. Um, and so if your roommate's boyfriend had COVID, we don't want you back at work until you've had sufficient tests that say that you're negative. And so we've taken this conservative approach. And I think what it's done is it's it's helped us to it's helped us to to maintain some goodwill with our employees. You know, up in Seattle, um, we were closed for a longer period of time, but eventually, um, you know, a number of us wanted to return back to the work office. And today we let people up in Seattle work from wherever they would like, from their house is fine or from the office is fine. And so, you know, on any given day today, there's uh, four or five, of, I think there's five of us here, um, but we have quite a bit of space relative to five people. And so we're able to physically distance. We have some UV sterilizers. And so, um, and we also, we, we kind of, we kind of are smaller groups, so we're able to kind of keep our own pod. So that's how we've stayed safe. You know, what I would say we could have done better, um, and I hear this from other CEOs as well, is, is that this pandemic is, it, it's a really scary thing for people. It's unnerving, it's created stress. And I think that, you know, we tried to move very quickly. And, you know, we probably could be even more intentional with our communications, with our, uh, with our, uh, discussions one-on-one -on -one with employees about their concerns and make sure that they are all kind of following our journey one step at a time. And I think that, you know, I think we did a great job, but I think that that's, that's always an area where we can improve, right? That's, yeah, that, that's absolutely important is, is the communication and, and being, I guess, present. Um, yeah. and, and it sounds like you really have your, your hands, hands on, on the issues and, and trying to lead the ship, um, as well as you know how, um, and, <laughs> What are your priorities then, uh, you know, looking, you know, about a year out, what, what do you, you know, prioritize over others to, for, for Nautilus Bio? Yeah. So for us, um, there are, you know, broadly, there are a few things that we need to do, right. And they're very interrelated. We need to get to the point over the course of the next 12 to 18 months that we have the ability to routinely take customer samples in and return valuable information to them that they have no way to analyze they get that information anywhere else in the world and to start building the body of evidence that our technique is reliable and returning correct results reliably that's job number one in order to do that i have to double the size of my staff overnight we have a you know it's an interesting phenomena a year ago year and a half ago You'd run an experiment, you'd get the results, you'd figure out what to do next. We're not in research mode largely anymore. We're in engineering mode, optimizing the, the 
protocol, figuring out how to build the next version of the thing that we have, figuring out how to make this thing go 50% faster to meet the spec that it needs. And in that world, there's 100 experiments in every single person's bucket that's piled up that needs to get done. And so we just need to grow our uh, our capacity and we've got to be able to, to, to build our engineering and our research and development organizations to be able to, to get to the goal that we want on the product side. On the commercial side of our business, uh, we're really focused on refining our business model, widening our engagement with customers, and signing the initial deals with customers that uh, enable us to start to engage in some meaningful areas that will demonstrate the capabilities of our platform. And those are that's kind of the stuff that is largely keeping me busy right now. Um, when I look forward, one of the big goals for me over the course of the last year has been to transform the company from a leadership perspective from an early stage development organization to a company that's ready to to go and introduce a product to the commercial markets and so we entered 2020 with Prague and myself being the only two executives at the company and over the course of the year so far we hired uh you know mary godwin who runs the operations organization for us she's been at this for four decades and has worked with me across a number of companies. Um, we hired Nick Nelson, who I talked about earlier, and then I've already uh, hired two other executives that are starting between now and the end of the year. And so we're going into 2021 with a team that's really set up to help us to move Nautilus into a commercialization phase. I had a quick question, you know, before we get to tying things up, though. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, you know, what's been the most fun part of your experience building this company? What's been the most fun part of building this company? So uh, I, I am a computer scientist at heart. I am an engineer at heart. The most fun for me has been actually getting involved and solving real problems and doing real engineering work. This company, my experience is actually quite different than my last company. And so when I founded Isilon in January of 2001, I was 26 years old and I didn't know a single thing about being a CEO. And I had to grow my staff from me to what ended up as 35 people at the end of year one, because we had a massive chunk of software to tackle, to go and do what we were trying to do at Isilon. Because I didn't know how to do anything as a CEO, that consumed all of my time. And that's what I did. Uh, at this company, Parag and I started with just the two founders for the first six or seven months, working through the tough challenge of, hey, is that algorithm going to work? And I took on a very different role, right? I mean, I know, I've you know, been a CEO from minuscule scale through public company. That stuff took 10% of my time. It's super easy for me to do. I spent 90% of my time on the biology and chemistry and education and on coding and actually working through the algorithmic pieces. So Parag was in the wet lab for those six, seven months when we were just the two of us. And I was, in, I was in front of a computer coding and it was a ton of fun. And believe it or not, even two, two and a half years in the company's life, I held on to doing some of the coding myself which was a refreshing change that I did not get to do at the last place. So so the coding skills didn't just fade away, you know, as you were, you know, many years as CEO at the other company? They didn't fade away. I mean, I, I, I have, I've done plenty of side projects along the way, even as I was CEO, but things, those things come back to you very quickly, right? Um, but now I don't do any more coding because there's a huge team of software engineers here now. Um, but... I still get involved in a lot of the engineering aspects of what we're building and how we're going to how we're going to move that forward. And, and it's it's a really fun part of what I do, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that are part of CEO's life that are that are mundane or stressful or hard or people oriented or whatever they might be. But for me, the engineering stuff is it's really energizing and fun. To conclude the episode, uh, we're, we're glad to give you um, a, a space to to share any thoughts, comments, or or uh, shameless plugs um, that you'd like our, our audience to hear. <laughs> shameless <laughs> plugs. Well, look, I think I, I think that uh, I've probably given you enough shameless plugs here. I mean, hopefully, what I've been able to convey is that you know. I think this is a hugely transformational company in the making, and I am incredibly excited and passionate about it. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, 
you, know, you, Jonathan and Forrest, giving me the opportunity to go and talk to your viewers and tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. And, you know, I'd encourage you all to stay tuned because I think that uh, over the course of the next year or two, this company is going to be announcing some really interesting stuff that's going to have real impact on human health and human happiness. And that's that's why I'm in this. Oh, that's Thank that's great much. to hear. I'm um, so exciting. And Nautilus Biotechnology um, for the audience is, is hiring. So if you look like you, uh, you've got the skill set and chops that and working with Sujal and his team, then that could be a great home for you. I'm Sujal Patel, founder and CEO of Nautilus Biotechnology. Stay tough. And that's a wrap of Probing the Proteome with Sujal Patel of Nautilus Bio. If you or a loved one suffer from allergies, our next episode may be right up your alley. We sit down with Connor Cullinane of Pirouette Medical. He and his team are developing an auto-injector drug delivery system. Their first offering is an epinephrine auto-injector for emergency treatment of severe allergic reactions. Subscribe and join the mailing list so you stay in the loop. Meanwhile, stay tough.